This is episode number 18 featuring Daniel Gerhardt's. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting. We call it Plen Air Painting. For those who don't know, Plen Air is a French term, which means open air, outdoors, outside. The French pronounce it Plen Air, others pronounce it Plain Air, but no matter how you pronounce it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outside to paint. And this show is all about the movement, the people, the painters, the collectors, the galleries, and the art. This week's podcast is brought to you by a new video, Secrets of Classical Painting with Juliet Aristides. Yes, classical painting does apply to plein air painting because it's painting from life. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting. You can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social or email. And please subscribe so it comes to you every week. And if you have feedback, email me at eric at plenairmagazine.com. Today's interview is brought to you by easelbrushclip.com. Now, let's get right to our interview with the amazing artist, Daniel Gerhardt. Hello, Dan. Good morning, Eric. Hey, uh, thanks for doing this today. I'm excited about this. You're one of my all-time favorite artists, and, you know, we've known each other for quite a while. And so this is going to be fun for people to learn more about you. I'm excited as well. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, good. Well, um, um, where did you and I first meet? Do you remember? My recollection is at um, Scott Christensen's studio um, probably about five to seven years ago for the artist um, show and shoot that we did with uh, Scott and a number of other people. I think that was the first time we met. I don't know if that's, it seems to me we met somewhere sooner or earlier than that, but I remember that's the first time we really connected on a one-on-one level. It was It was cool. I got to meet your son, Nick. Right. And who I think is now married. Is that right? He is. Yes, he is. <laughs> wow. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. So, Dan, for the people out there who might not uh, know who you are, if that's even possible, um, why don't you tell people what it is you do and how you think of yourself as an artist? Well, I um, loved to draw and paint when I was a, a kid, actually draw. I uh, started when I was about, I don't even know the exact age, 15, 12 to 14. Um, I was a typical Wisconsin kid. I loved to play baseball and football and hunt and fish. Uh, one day it was pouring rain and one of my closest friends said, Hey, why don't we, why don't we do some drawing? Um, he had some of the, the Walter Foster books on how to draw animals and, um, nature and things. So we sat down and basically just tried to copy some of the drawings that, um, Walter had us go through and found I had a knack for it. I, 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 I really enjoyed it. Um, Entered a couple of small competitions in grade school. Um, I think I won an award with a little drawing I did of a duck. And um, it kind of went from there. Um, I had a great high school art teacher who was really encouraging. Uh, Kind of a dry wit. um, Made it fun. um, Fairly unpredictable in his nature. Um, So trying to guess his um, inclinations... Uh, as we kind of fought our way through learning to draw and paint, um, it was just all, uh, you know, a, a neat experience. He was tough on us. Um, I, you know, again, com- uh, coming from a very small town in Wisconsin, um, I, I then went to school in Chicago. And when I got there, I thought that I would be blown away by the talent um, be- because of the, you know, the small town I came from, but it it turns out that John, uh, my high school art teacher, John Batinger, was a firmly um, planted the fundamentals in me, and and those kind of still carry me through today. Um, Just the solid principles of design, um, strong emphasis on drawing, 
um, just accuracy in drawing and values and, and tone. Uh, so, you know, got to, went to, got to school in Chicago. And you we went did, to school at uh, Paladin Chisel, is that right, or where did you go? Uh, it was the American Academy of Art. American Academy uh, which of was, Art. Yeah, right, you know, basically across the street from the Art Institute. Uh, it was a great school. Uh, the teachers were inspiring. Um, the alumni of the school was, you know, really well established. Um, you know, just great, uh, great traditions in painting, and uh, Richard Schmid kind of leading the way in that regard. Um, you probably at the time didn't realize how really lucky you were. I I still have to pinch myself, and honestly, just. Um, very grateful for the opportunity. I mean, just the time that I went to the, the nucleus of, of students, um, you know, it was Nancy Guzik, Scott Burdick, Rose Franzen, Tim Lawson, um, just a, you know, Clayton Eric, Beck, Clayton Beck um, Eric Weigart. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, uh, people who really were competitive, but not in a negative way. It was never, uh, we had, um, you know, we were always striving to be the best. We were always working hard to kind of outdo one another, but it was never in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sense that was, that was uh, defeating or negative. And we're kind of still the same today. We still push each other. You know, I'm, I keep track of what, what these guys are doing and, um, I'm trying to do the best that I can do. And I, when I say that I look at their work, I normally draw most of my inspiration from um, the work that was done, you know, 500 years ago to this day. Uh, you know, just looking at a lot of just a great art um, and how can that motivate me, you know, but also how can I make it current? You know, how, you know not just what did they do and not just to paint that style, but how can I uh, turn it on? I'm kind of digressing a bit here, but... Um, anyway, so I was in uh, art school, great group of students who continue to push each other today. Um, I went to school in Chicago for commercial art. It was the only thing that I knew one could make a living at. Um, got an illustration degree, started working in, in commercial art for about a year to a year and a half and realized that it was not a good fit for my um, personality. I, I just didn't do well. I could I could paint and draw as well as most of the people in the studios, but I, I it wasn't a good fit. So um, about that time, uh, Nancy, or actually uh, Tim Lawson and I were um, just before I left Chicago, we're working in a frame shop, small dingy, uh, assembling metal frames for this print shop and Tim and I were up there working away one night and he showed me an armload of plein air studies that he had done and said hey these are these are really invigorating I love doing them and people pay me for them you know and I, I can kind of make a living at it now you should give it a try um, that same evening he was we were going on and he was talking about um, he said he had just heard that Richard Schmidt moved back to Chicago and I didn't even know who Richard was <laughs> really, I mean, I'd, I'd seen his work at the Academy, but it didn't really connect. And Tim said, well, how do you think we can get a hold of him? I said, well, I don't know. Let's call information. So we did, uh, found his number, and Tim, in his boldness, called him up and invited all of us over. <laughs> and so, so, so uh, we, the next, I don't know, that Sunday, we were all in Richard's uh, living room with a, you know, just soaking it in. And, and he was as generous then as he is today with helping um, just me, multitudes of young artists, um, you know, fanning the flame of inspiration and excitement in them. And it was the same for, for us. Um, I, we took a few plein air painting trips to northern Wisconsin with Nancy and Richard and Scott and Rose and I and a few other people. Albert Handel was part of that group. And we we painted and we talked and we um, just learned and um, Richard, you know, I was I was an illustrator at that point, uh, so everything that um, I was taught in illustration was to have a style, have a look, have a um, you know, identify yourself by the style of your brushstroke. Well, 
that didn't really work in, in fine art, in painting. Uh, Richard did his best to beat that out of me. You know, it's funny because I, when I would look at Richard's work, I would see, you see the big, bold brush strokes and you see the technique. Um, but what, what I didn't see was all of the work underneath it, the exact values, the perfect edge work. Um, so I was trying to put the technique on top of, of crumbling foundation of bad values and, you know, inappropriate edges. And so, you know, he worked to retool that in all of us to, to get, to kind of get us to see the essentials. And, um, so it's, it's interesting as I teach today, um, Technique is one of the last things that I address. Um, it's you know really about um, really getting yourself to see accurate values, um, paint appropriate edges, um, making sure that relative warm and cool of the subject is in keeping with the light that's hitting the subject. So um, you know that throughout history there have been special times in art we you know we look back on the um, the impressionist in france and the the people who followed the lead of monet and they'd sit around in the coffee shops in, in paris and we have romanticized those times i think historically this time of you guys with richard will be romanticized in history because uh it's a very similar kind of a thing right you've got richard who's kind of the nucleus the leader of this group of amazing, absolutely high quality artists who have all each in their own right become their own masters today, uh, yourself and these other people that you've mentioned. And, and I think that um, that will be looked back upon very fondly as a very special moment in, in art history. I would completely agree. Um, you know, He's really uh, developed a legacy of, of you know, people who are aspiring to the, the great academic traditions, you know, and it's 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 there's there's th that leg, and then there's also the atelier leg, which is it, it's been pretty amazing to see the two kind of come together in a lot of people. Well, it's really interesting when I, when I started Fine Art Connoisseur, kind of which has been uh, I think about twelve or thirteen years ago, maybe more. Um, there were almost no ateliers. Um, it was very hard for anybody to find instruction uh, of that uh, atelier method. The, you know, there certainly was the Art Students League. There was the Academy in, sure. in Chicago, and there was the Florence Academy and, um, and a couple of others. But uh, that, that's not very many when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. And now today, I mean, there are probably um, a couple hundred pretty high quality ateliers now and, and uh, probably a few thousand 20 year olds who are studying in those ateliers. It's a big difference. It's changing. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. To, to see some of the competitions, I had the privilege of uh, being a judge in, in the uh, art renewal center um, competition a few years ago and, um, or one of the judges and wow, the talent coming through um, is, a, is really Really amazing, really yeah. inspiring. It really is. I did that as well, and it was um, it was eye opening how much high quality talent is out there, and and what's happening. Well, then you know the nice thing about these competitions is it really elevates quality, right? Everybody has to has to really shine because yes. um, there's so much good stuff out there that you just have to keep getting better and better to be able to compete. Exactly, exactly. And I've, I've always loved competitions for that reason. I was, I've, been, uh, to be, uh, part, I've been part of the Prix de West for 20-some years, and I've used that competition for that very reason, just to push myself. And now the ARC uh, Salon and, and some of the OPA shows, it's great. It is fantastic to have something to shoot for. Um, well, what uh, for the people who who don't know what it is you paint, and I know it's hard to describe w w a visual uh, verbally, but um, if you could summarize essentially what you're most known for in terms of the paintings that you're doing, what would you, how would you summarize it? 
Well, certainly they're realistic. Um, uh, you know, in, in, you know, I, I love the work of, um, Sergeant Soroya and Zorn, um, Bougaro, all of these guys painted, you know, any, any great master painted light well. Uh, when I visit a museum, what stands out to me, it's, it's the pieces that have the most convincing feeling of light that, that just resonate and stick with me. So that, you know, that's really been, um, what I strive for in my work. And I, 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 when I receive emails from people or comments, um, that's particularly what they they point out is that why well, the light really came through, whether it be you know bright sunlight or very soft um, descending north light or you know uh, it's important to me to try to capture the specific light that I'm seeing, not just to impose a light source on every subject that I see, but to, to capture the effect that that's there. And you're mostly um, doing you're mostly doing figures in landscape or fig, figures in interiors, but you're mostly doing figures. Is that correct? I, I that's primarily what people see or you know are kind of the, the showcase pieces of shows. But I do a lot of landscapes. I still paint um, a fair amount of still lifes. Um, do you do a lot of plein air still? I do. Right. I mean, even the the large figurative pieces that you see. Um, either were painted entirely or in part plein air. So do you um, take, uh, you do some pretty substantially large pieces. Uh, do you take a large canvas on location or do you start out with a small canvas and do studies? What's your I, process? Bo- both of them. Um, de- depending on the piece, depending on the model's availability, um, I often, uh, you know, the best case scenario is to always work from life. Um, it's highly impractical often. But um, uh, just to take a, a piece, um, a couple pieces specifically, um, I won an award last year in the Art Renewal Center with a piece called When Hope Comes. It was a large piece. It was a 60 by 60 canvas of a girl standing outside with some crows and a single dove. Anyway, uh, how I started that was I took the model outside knew basically the pose that I wanted, photographed her, um, worked out the design in the studio on the computer, uh, then with the photos um, drew the figure on the canvas, on on the final canvas, the 60 by 60, took her out on location again, um, strapped the, I have a surveyor's tripod that I stake in the ground, and um, the canvas is on that, and the model is posing in the position exactly as the photograph was. And uh, then I begin to work from life as, as much as I can. So and, why, why not sketch her on location just because of time? The time, um, yeah, that's a big thing. This particular pose that she was in was really kind of awkward. She was bent over and hunched over, and it was really windy. Um, I have to see things Exactly. I, you know, for me to, um, I have to see it. So anatomically, if I'm going to get it accurate, it's got to be completely still. And it was, it was just impractical, impractical for me to get the the drawing down. It's just easier um, if I can do it this way. I don't always do it that way, but uh, in a case like this where the pose was pretty extreme, um, you know, if I'm working with children or animals. Um, you know, of course, you have to watch out for photographic distortion. Um, you need to make sure that that things are, um, you know, not out of whack in perspective. Um, so, you know, how do you, you, how do, you do that? Um, by double checking it once I'm out there, um, by taking head measurements and working my way around, making sure that the distance from the hand, you know, or for instance. If the hand is extended toward you, then you then I know that there's going to be some photographic distortion, or you know, better yet, I'll, I'll I'll make sure that when I photograph them, I'm using a long enough lens so that it eliminates most of the camera distortion. You know, if I'm, you know, if I have a zoom lens, I'm making sure that I'm at least zoomed out to you know 80, uh, 
you know, 80, what's the, what's the term, you know, I don't the, know the, millimeters. The, yeah, I think it's 80 <laughs> millimeters. I'm, I'm at least that far out, you know, I'm stepping back so right. that uh, you don't have the distortion. And then I also check it when I'm out there. So I'll have the model in pose and I'll take a measurement, you know, how big is her hand compared to her head and, or how many head lengths down to her, from her head down to her arm and just double check things just to make sure that things are in the right position. Now, do you typically paint in sight size or do you, do you just estimate? No, I, I do just estimate. I do measure, but it's with, um, just with your brush, just with my brush, right. Um, just a head size and then I'll just go down and, and, you know, put tick marks on my canvas. This is how many heads it is from the top of the head down to the foot or wherever the, it, the composition uh, dictates. Um, one of the but, things, one of the things I noticed about you when we painted together at Scott Christensen's, we painted a figure. It was um, it was an old cowboy. Um, it was Christie's father. I can't remember his name. And right. and um, I, you, everybody else was drawing with paint, and you drew in on the canvas first before painting. Right. And, and I was curious about that. Why why you do that? You know, it, it for me, it simplifies the process. Uh, you would think that it would be an extra step and it would actually waste time. For me, it does the opposite. If I can accurately place the drawing, now I'm not, it is, it, it's, it's not a detailed drawing by any means, but it's just uh, a placement, you know, um, so that when I place my darkest darks and my, my accents, my, the shadow pattern or whatever, that it's locked in and it's in the right spot and I don't have to move it. You know, I, um, you know, I'm not drawing and then painting by number. I am drawing, and then I will continue to draw with a brush. But it just helps me to place those key um, drawing points um, accurately right off the bat, so that I don't have to continually find my drawing as I'm painting. Uh, and it actually speeds the process up. Now, do um, you do that with landscapes as well? No, I don't. If I'm doing landscapes or still lifes, it's not as critical unless the still life has a lot of, you know, or um, unless the landscape has a lot of, you know, architectural elements in it, then I might sketch things out a little bit. But yeah, and, and using vine charcoal and not uh, compressed is important because the vine basically dissolves in the oil, oil paint. It doesn't, um, smear. doesn't, doesn't smear and, and kind of Discolor, yeah. bleed through and right. Yeah, so one of the things that I think a lot of people um, take for granted is that um, uh, the great figure painters of the past went outdoors and learned to paint figures outdoors. If you look at the academic um, traditions, uh, especially the Russian school, the Russians require uh, outdoor painting, uh, landscape painting, but they also require taking the figure out into the landscape. And their their theory is that you can't really properly learn to paint a figure until you can paint a figure outdoors in full sunlight or full shade uh, or, or mm. a portion thereof. What are your feelings about that? Uh, yeah. I bel well, I don't know. If I would say that you can't learn to paint one, but it, going outside with a figure adds exponential problems to the process. Yes, it um, does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really, I talk about it pretty extensively in our, uh, the beginning of autumn video where, um, you know, there are a lot of considerations. The light is moving, the model's moving because of the wind or the, you know, swatting insects or, or whatever might be happening. So it takes, um, it takes pa you know, just patience and you have to uh, you just have to stick with it, and you have to, you know, the first several, many attempts will probably not turn out as well as you know you can paint if you're primarily a studio paint painter. But if you stick with it, the dividends are incredible. Um, you can see the color and the light. Um, a pivotal point in my career was um, the first year or two that I was starting this, I uh, there was a huge Soroya exhibition that came through New York. I uh, went to St. Louis and San Diego. Um, I think it was 91 or 92. Um, 
there were hundreds of Soroya's paintings in this exhibition, among them a sewing the sail piece, um, you know, just many, many of his, uh, you know, really uh, masterworks. So having seen this exhibition from life, as I mentioned to somebody else, you almost had to have sunscreen on going to the show because the light that blasted off of his canvases was just impressive. He could, and have, ne he could have never faked that in the studio. He never, you could never fake that. You just can't. You have to be out there to see that. So you uh, do you do a lot of um, you see a lot of uh, what I call rim light. When I was studied photography, rim light was where the light was kind of coming around the edge of the head. And right. you, you have a lot of uh, rim light in a lot of your paintings where you get that kind of glowing afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon light. Mm -hmm. um, when you're taking a model out there, that light only lasts for 10 minutes. Exactly. So do you kind of get out there early, sketch everything in? I, I mean, you, you start putting all your... your um, your color and your value in and then lay that light in at the last minute or do you just know you're going to have it and you anticipate it fake it what do you do how do you there's a couple of ways to do it that's a, that's one way yeah i mean there's there's a certain amount of blocking in that you can do at the beginning but um you know that that rim light as you mentioned what that will do is it will throw i mean i can't go out there earlier in the day and really block much in because that rim light, in order for that rim light to glow all the other values in the face, in the, in the front plane of the face, need to be darkened and cooled in order for that light to work. So I can't do a whole lot too early. What I'll often do is make it a two-night endeavor where I'll, I'm going on to the first night, I'll look at it, I know what I want to do, and again, I'll maybe draw it in. Uh, from the photo, but or or you know I'll, I'll draw the the model down and I'll mix up a few tones that I think might be close, and then when that light hits, it's um, crunch time and you're just a lot of times just throwing in tones uh, as best you can, and then sometimes I will either go back the following night, you know, if the light is the same, um, which I've done uh, you know many times or you can potentially clean it up with a photograph having captured, you know, all of the accurate tones from life. Um, you can, well, as you know, you can't, you cannot take any camera on the face of the earth and get a good sunset paint, a good right. sunset picture. You're either going to get it too dark or too light because it's compensating for the sky and for the, the ground. And, um, very, very few people can, can really master that, and, and it's usually not very accurate. So I, I would assume the photograph is not the perfect tool for that kind of a thing. You know, it, it is only for the drawing. I right. only use the photograph for the drawing. I am right. completely relying on what I've literally smashed in on the canvas in those 10 minutes um, for all of my value, for all of the temperature, for all the color. I'm not... I'm just basically moving those things around now so that the drawing, uh, to bring the drawing into accuracy. Um, but, you know, or a lot of times, sometimes what I'll do as well is if I, if I, if it's, you know, if I'm traveling or if I have a, a real tight deadline or, you know, um, working with kids, I will do a nine by 12, you know, very quick study from life. Again, just throwing in the colors on the canvas, not even often paying a, too much attention to the drawing, knowing that I'm just going to use that as a reference for value and color. Um, and then, um, you know, um, taking the studies and the photograph in the, in the studio and then build the piece from that. Th that's not the best case scenario, but that works pretty well. What's the largest painting you've ever done? Um, I think a six by ninety six by seventy two. All right, and and what's the painting that you haven't done yet that is in the back of your mind that you're going to get one get done one day? <laughs> oh gosh, oh you know I'd love to do a series on the Beatitudes um, of Jesus. Um, 
I did, you know, just different. Um, I love, you know, I love contrasts. I love um, dark and light. I love um, whatever contrast. So it can be emotional or physical. Um, I love paintings that kind of depict that, that have a dominance of one or the other, uh, but show the kind of the uh, fullness of our experience here. Um, so, you know, working through that, um, I just did kind of a mini series on um, uh, the, the story of Les Miserables. Um, so it was there was some of that in there where you can work out, you know, the the tragedy and the in the hope, and the, um, so yeah, those are some of the themes that I that I love to do. So let's talk about uh, early stage painters for a minute. You, let's let's assume that somebody's listening to this and they're relatively new at painting, or maybe then they've been doing it for a while, but they haven't really landed on exactly what they want to do yet. What's what are some of the key things that you would give advice to painters on um, that they should be thinking about? Perhaps things that they might not hear anywhere else. You know, I. I, the, the biggest thing that I have to say to people is to uh, work from life as much as you possibly can and stick with it. Um, and, um, don't try not to be discouraged at, at first it's, it's very discouraging because it's, it's very difficult to get progress. Um, but if you st stick with it, um, you know, it always pays off. Um, another thing that's really critical is to find somebody that you can get a great critique from. Um, that could be your spouse, your partner, your best friend, your painter, friends. It could be a professional painter. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, you know, uh, just someone. I mean, everybody has experienced light and seen human bodies. So they, you know, most people can tell if... Um, something is off. What you need to find is somebody who's honest with you, um, that, that doesn't just flatter you or praise you with every brush stroke, but to find somebody that will tell you this is a problem. Or this my is daughter a Grace will walk into my studio and, and she'll walk in and in 10 seconds she'll say, Dad, that head's too big. Right. Jennifer, my wife is the same way, and, <laughs> you know, and that's a blessing. It is. That is a blessing to have somebody that will be that honest and frank with you. You have to be able to take it. You know, Jennifer, um, one of the things she tells a lot of the students that come through our studio is that you, you have to be able to take a critique and not feel defeated, but only inspired to push further. Um, take, take the words that you're hearing. You know, not everything everybody says is accurate, but if they're saying something, there's probably something to it that 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 um, you have to consider. So, so you do a, you you said you had students coming through the studio. Do you do um, do you have regular full time students that you're teaching? Do you have workshops? I know you have videos. Yeah, tell us a little bit about what your your offerings are in terms of teaching. Primarily, um, well, we we. Primarily workshops. I've taught workshops, you know, at, at a lot of the workshop venues um, in the past. We primarily do them out of our studio now. It's a little easier. I've, you know, all the tools that I need there. Um, you don't have to get on an airplane. That's I don't nice. have to get on an airplane, which is handy. Um, but uh, it's been, you know, gratefully there's been quite a demand for our workshops at home. So to satisfy some of that, we've come up with uh, videos, which basically, you know, I really cover everything in those videos that I do in the workshops. And they're, um, a, you know, a great, I, I love to teach. You know, I, we don't do it that often or two or three weeks a year, but. Um, well, they're great tools. You know, they, they um, you, as you know, we're in that business and, uh, you know, for, for many people like me who are, I kind of design everything that I do for people like myself because that's kind of how I think. But, you sure. know, for a guy like me who has a, a full-time job running a business, 
Uh, other people have full-time jobs doing other things, but they want to paint. I went to a physical exam this week, and the doctor tells me he's an artist. He's trying to learn to paint, but he never has time to go to workshops. Mm. And so th- those things are very valuable because you can watch them over and over and over again, and you can really get the the essence of things. It's still good to go to the workshops, obviously, if you can, but um, right. these these are great study tools. Um, so I, I want to fast forward into a couple other areas before we wrap up, and 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 then um, and then we'll say goodbye. But the um, the one thing I think it's important for people to understand are the struggles. I was on the phone with Richard Schmid one day when I first, I think the first time I talked to him or met him many 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 years ago, and and uh, he was talking to me about being frustrated over a particular painting and i it was actually kind of soothing to me to understand that even he continues to have some struggles what what are some of the struggles that you go through as a painter what are the struggles that you had to go through in developing your career uh, you know there's always the um yeah we're always as artists we're always striving to get to the next level. Um, the question is, what do you do with that energy? You know, is it going to beat, beat and batter you up to the point where you can't move forward? Or are you going to use it to um, inspire you to, 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 to move forward? You know, I think that's one of the biggest ones is, is you know, you know, everybody wants to, to know they have purpose. Everybody wants to know that they're doing something that has meaning. I think, um, you know, s- sitting behind the easel, sometimes you wonder how much, what does it really matter? What is, you know, is this really important? Um, I, I really believe it is. Why? Um, because I think there's a, I mean, I personally, um, having gone through struggles, the medium that touches my soul the most I think is music. I am so grateful that those artists took the time to develop their talents so that the music that is a balm to my soul um, is just that. You know, um, they pour their life into it. You know, it, it, and it's not the music that, that heals me. It's, it's, the, it's the yearning to see beyond the music. It's, it's knowing that there's a... a you know, a larger story, a, a bigger purpose um, beyond the music. I, I'm going to say it's God inspiring all of it um, and pointing us to his beauty and his goodness and his mercy. Um, that is what drives me to, to push farther. Um, you know, when I, when I lose sight of that, that's when I struggle. When I lose sight of what the real purpose is, that's when I struggle. When, I, when it becomes all about me, um, and I get too self-centered, then, um, things can spiral. Um, you know, if I'm away from the easel too long, you know, that, who was it? Um, uh, forgot the, it was, uh, a, a, comp- a musical composer said that if I'm, a, you probably remember it, you know, if I'm away from, um, if I don't practice for a day, I notice it. If I don't practice for a a week or two days, my wife notices it. If I don't practice for a week, the audience knows it. Well, that's, that is completely true. I think I've misquoted that. But um, you get the idea that you have to, if I, if I don't paint for two weeks or a month, which is rare, um, it, you have to relearn a lot of the stuff. You have to hang in there and stick with it in order to kind of get the rhythm back. Well, that's why, you know, you know, I do this event every year in the Adirondacks and I have a, I, I do it in a couple of places. I do the Adirondacks, I do uh, Maine in October and I'm doing New Zealand this, this Ooh. February. And we paint for a solid week. We go out and paint two, three, four paintings a day, every day for a solid week. And right. something magical happens at the end of that week. Um, you know, I, I can go into the beginning of that week because I, I don't get the chance to go out and paint every day. I have a studio and I go out at night some nights after putting the kids to bed. But you know what that, that what life is like when you have kids. Right. And so, uh, but when I am, am painting solid every day, and you know, the beginning of the week, I start out pretty rocky. And by the end of the week, 
I've actually taken a step forward that will never reverse itself. There's something about it. Uh, it it's you know you know how That's when people people will tell you you probably don't ever have never experienced this, but you know I people you you show somebody your painting and they go oh nice colors you know or they'll find some nice thing to say even though they don't really mean anything. Sure. But when when uh, after last year um, I did this this piece and all of a sudden all these unsolicited compliments were happening and I knew I had taken a big leap because I never got that level of unsolicited comments before. Hmm. And so I, I think having that, that concentration of time and, and I think that's great advice. Obviously everybody needs to be out there as much as they can, especially like you, if you're a pro, I mean, you got to be doing it, but having that opportunity to just keep, practicing and practicing so that you don't lose it i think that that's when you kind of take steps towards the next level exactly so, i love the way yeah i love the way you put it that you know that, that that you you hit a level that you can't reverse from that that is true um but it takes some effort to push to that level so when um, you're somebody like you who paints every day or most days um how do you get yourself to the next level because you're already very highly accomplished. How, how do you push yourself? What, what, what uh, forced action do you take to try to get yourself up to another level? You know, seeing great art is always a shot in the arm, you know, visiting museums. I, I'm still, um, pursue study through, um, looking to see what's been done. Um, you know, so I, I saw there was a, you know, visiting the great museums as often as possible. And some, you know, sometimes it's, you know, so I went to the Sargent show in New York, but was really taken by the work of another artist, you know, or something else, you know. So what was it about, you know, really just going there with an open mind and, and just absorb and copy? You know, I, I'm i an advocate of copying great art, not doing copies that you you know, certainly you're not going to plagiarize and sell them, but um, well, you learn you learn from them when you copy them. Incredible amounts of information you learn. Yeah, the you know uh, maybe I'll just do a very quick study of the tonality of an Emil Carlson painting. Wow, how did how did he get so much out of so little in terms of color or um, you know just the the edge work of you know, Thomas Dewing or Nikolai Fetchin, you know, so I'll, I'll walk around, um, you know, I'll, I'll, if I struggle early on, I remember I, I, painting lips was just a challenge. I couldn't get them to not look like wax lips. Um, so I spent the whole day at the Met drawing Sargent's lips, you know, just the edge quality of how he handled, um, you know, you know, so attack your weaknesses. You know, what is it about? What? Where am I falling short? You know, people keep. You know, whatever it might be, study that. You know. Well, it turns out. Targeted. It turns out, uh, Dan. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but it it turns out that um, hit, that scientifically they've learned that if you do what's called chunk learning, where let's say you want to learn to paint lips, if you just concentrate on lips over and over and over and over again, not try to do the whole face, mm -hmm. just do lips over and over and over again, that that gets into your DNA and you'll master lips. And then you move on to noses or eyeballs or ears or whatever it is, cheeks, mm. you know? So, uh, we, we just actually released a new DVD on that with Brian Mark Taylor on how artists learn and, and, really? and, um, and with exercises in that. So I think that, um, you know, you're on to something there about just going out and, and studying one little piece at a time. So uh, I want to fast forward to a couple other things, uh, and then we're going to have to part, and this could go on forever. I apologize. I wish mm. we could. Um, one artist that if you could get an hour of time with that artist, any artist in history, who is it? What would you ask? Oh, gosh. Wow. Where do you start? Um, yeah, one of my favorite artists, um, Solomon J. Solomon, just incredible work. His dynamic, powerful designs, his impeccable anatomy, his um, ability to capture light, 
Um, I would I would love to spend some time talking with him. Um, what would you ask? Oh, uh, you know, I guess how does he develop his design work? You know, um, when you're working with multiple figures and um, creating these really powerful dynamic designs, what, you know, what do you start with first? Is it the is it the um, the abstract design or is it the figures and in, um, you know, um, William Bouguereau, you know, there are multitudes of artists that paint as tight as him, but very few that can capture the in, uh, quality of air and atmosphere um, coupled with the impeccable draftsmanship. Um, you know, how does he accomplish that? You know, what is, what is his you know, routine. Yeah. I don't know if there are any notes. I guess, I think there were some notebooks. Um, I'll have to ask Graydon Parrish. I think he knows, knows where all that stuff is hidden. We should find that. Mm. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's one of the reasons we like to do videos is, and, and interviews like this, because we want to capture people for the future, you know, so that people can understand what you're thinking and, and, uh, you know, what your technique is and so on. So last question. It's your last day on earth. Mm. You are gathered around with your closest friends and your family. Everything that you've done, all of your work has been destroyed. Nothing of it exists. The only thing, only way we can find out anything about you is from your final words. So you have three truths to share with other painters or with your kids or with family members. Three truths in your life. What are those three truths? Love God, love people, have hope, you know, I guess would be the three things, you know. There is hope. Outstanding. Dan, thank you yeah. so much for your time today. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks again to Daniel Gerhardt. What a fabulous artist and what great insights. The interview was sponsored by easelbrushclip.com. It's a cool tool. Everybody's picking them up for their easels. Now they're securing their umbrellas with them as well. Watch the video at www.easelbrushclip.com. This podcast, episode number 18, is brought to you by Secrets of Classical Painting with Juliet Aristides. It's a brand new video outlining her entire step-by-step -step process for painting amazing, beautiful skin tones and, and beautiful nudes and figures. And you can learn a lot about plein air painting from painting the figure. Um, you, you, of course, you can do it outdoors, too. Learn more about this new video at StreamlineArtVideo.com. Well, plein air is hot. The movement is hot. It's just, <laughs> well, the plein air movement is red hot, which may be why plein air magazine is the top representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. We're really proud of that, and we thank you for that. If you don't have a subscription... Uh, pick one up online at plenairmagazine.com or drop by Barnes & Noble. We prefer the subscription route, but either is okay. Well, this was fun. Let's do it again sometime like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye. <laughs>